Um, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, month's Sunday with uh, Belta series. Um, it's great that we have Demetrius with us today. I think he's going to talk about a topic that's uh, on everybody's mind nowadays with the internet and um, with our students writing. But before I introduce him, uh, first let me tell you a little bit about uh, Belta. First off, my name is uh, John Arnold and I am the events officer for BELTA. And BELTA is the uh, Belgian English Language Teachers Association. Um, and um, we, our focus is to um, supply teachers with um, professional development in our field. Uh, and part of that, we do these uh, Sundays with BELTA webinars, one Sunday a month. Um, we have different topics. Uh, so this month is Dimitri's. Uh, last month we had uh, Damian Williams talk, uh, talk about the, the Urban Landscape Project. And next month, as you can see in the box in the lower uh, right-hand corner, we'll have Joanna Sterling talking about teaching humans online. We also hold a, a conference every year in April. And I'm, pr I'm happy to say that very shortly um, we'll be putting out the proposal for that conference. It will be held on the 23rd of April, 2016, in the capital of Belgium, uh, Brussels. Um, so if you're interested, please look on our website for uh, maybe submitting a proposal for that conference um, or attending that conference. This year at our conference, uh, the Learning Technology SIG has graciously offered two scholarships um, for people um, to present at the conference. So you can read more about that on our website, uh, www.beltabelgium.com. So enough about us. Let me introduce our speaker for today, and we can get started. Uh, Demetrius is an EFL teacher, um, author, and oral examiner. Um, he is the 2013 IATFL Learning Technology Scholarship winner and a Microsoft Expert innovate, Innovative uh, Educator for 2015. Uh, he has been teaching for more than 20 years and applies his knowledge and experience to introducing innovation and change into the daily teaching practice. His views and work are shared um, in his columns in the ELT News the Belta Bulletin, and in his uh, presentations in many conferences in Greece and abroad. And if I'm not mistaken, Demetrius, didn't you present for us, uh, not this past summer, but two summers at our summer conference as well, didn't you? Yeah. Yes. Uh, which was also very popular. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Demetrius, and um, I'm looking forward to what you have to say today about copy and paste. Good luck. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm, I feel very happy that I'm on familiar ground because I've presented for Belta again. Um, it seems it's going to be a, a family um, webinar, which means that um, you can feel free to participate. Originally, this was intended to be a workshop, but because it's quite difficult to um, turn a webinar into a workshop, um, I've changed lots of things that I wanted to do, but I hope that you can actively contribute by um, adding your comments on the chat box, which is on your uh, right, top right. All right. So today we're going to talk about what's very commonly known as copy-paste, and the official word is plagiarism. Um, we're going to talk about why you should deal with it, um, I'm going to show you a student's project, which is indicative of what most students do. Uh, I'm going to share with you how um, I approach the issue and what kind of results I had. Then we'll see how you can teach them um, to attack information and how you can, you can teach them how to um, 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 synthesize information, analyze information, then we can see how you can raise awareness, um, how you can help in the evaluation part, how you can add um, this element into the evaluation part, how you can use technology, and finally I'll give you some tips and hints. Um, apart from what John said, I, I'd like to add that I, add, I 
teach at a um, primary school and my students usually are um, 9, 10, 11 years old. The school has adopted a one-to-one -one approach, which means that all the students at these ages have their own tablet. And they can browse the internet, they can use interactive um, course books. Um, so even though I teach at the primary school, uh, the problem seems to, be, seems to be there. And since the school introduced that in 2009, for the past six years, I've had to face that nearly on a daily basis. Now, first of all, let's see what, is, what plagiarism is. Uh, according to um, Webster's Dictionary, it's the act of using another person's words or ideas without giving credit to that person. Doesn't that sound a bit too typical? Impersonal, academic, has this got to do with your daily practice? I would like to, to um, um, share with you my own personal experience. My older daughter um, was at junior high school a couple of years ago, and she was asked to, um, to do a project. She had to find information, um, analyze them, synthesize them, and produce a project. When I came back from work, I found her um, copying things from the internet. And I said, honey, you know, you, you can actually be caught for that. Um, this, this is not the, the practice you should follow. And she said, well, don't worry Dad, about it. But I said, there is software that can detect you. This is called plagiarism. It's a kind of offense and it's unfair and doesn't, doesn't comply with the school rules. I said, oh, well, Dad, don't worry about it. I'm not going to give it in a digital form. It's going to be handwritten. So my 15, 14, 15 year old daughter at the time had already found a way um, to cheat. She found a leeway um, to um, bypass the system and basically develop some survival technique because she wanted things to be fast and easy and she was a bit lazy as well. So the next question crossing your mind is, why should I be bothered about it? Does it really concern me? I will not answer the question now. I would like you to keep it at the back of your mind. And this is something that we're going to discuss towards the end of the presentation. In the meantime, feel free to post your presentations in the presenter's box, and we can talk about them at the end of the presentation. Since I talked to you about my daughter, and I would like to share with you something that um, um, a student of mine gave me. A few years ago, when we first introduced the uh, uh, tablets in class, part of their homework was um, to um, do a project. I asked him to imagine that their English cl class has won a competition and the prize is a trip to New York. Where can your class stay? What can you do there? I would like you to create a short presentation to share with your class. What you are going to read now is the actual um, um, PowerPoint slides that the students and that my student handed in. I have to clarify that my student is, was a fifth grade uh, pupil. That means that he's, he must have been then 10 or 11 years old. Is that the typical language you would expect from a 10, 12 year, 11 year old student? Go to the next slide. This is exactly the um, slides that he handed in. I have not um, um, 
touched anything. This is exactly the way he presented it in class. And this is the next one. He wanted to talk about New York. As you read, you've, you've read all these three slides, I want you to try and think of something that strikes you as wrong, something that strikes you as weird. And for Radhi, who has just joined us, um, I've just shared three slides from students' work. The project was on, on presenting about New York. Their class was about to go there on a school trip. Okay. Did you notice something wrong there? Something that your rather 10, 11-year-old um, pupil would write? The level is usually A1 or A2 maximum, uh, according to the common European framework. Or as you would say, in other frameworks, it's um, elementary, probably post-elementary. Did you notice any um, anything wrong there? Did you notice anything strange? Can't see anything on the chat box. Okay. Well, to me, many many things struck me as weird. First of all, the language there was not the language that they had been taught. Secondly, if we go back, I couldn't help noticing. If you look there at the underlined parts, these are actual actual links, which meant that their work was not original. And I. When I asked the students who, who presented that, uh, who I am, Pei, Frank Williams, and Peter Marino were, it was very hard for him to explain. As if this was not enough, when it came to his presentation, when he wanted to present that in class, he could hardly read um, the text. And apart from that, he couldn't uh, um, explain to his classmates simple words like refuse, collaboration, resort development, um, even the word interiors. So obviously, that was that was plagiarism. He had copied it and pasted it um, from a site. Did you see any kind of sources mentioned anywhere? Obviously not. There was nothing there. My student was very proud because he had spent time um, trying to find the information. He just copied and pasted them. And basically, what he did was just presented it on, on the PowerPoint slides. Nothing more. Now, this, this comes from Bloom's taxonomy. Ideally, when, when you ask your students to do a project, you hope that the higher thinking field, your students will will um, will use analysis, synthesis, and finally they will evaluate what they have produced. Do you think that in my case, my students has actually used any of these skills? Well, it seemed to me that he basically copied pasted and he couldn't be bothered, simply because. Well, what kind of reason do you think there might be? I, it took me quite a long time to think about it. And after a certain point, I felt that it was partially my mistake. And as the presentation progresses, I will explain why. In the meantime, I can't see anything on the chat box. But right now, John is going to post a, um, a mini therapy. I would like your opinion if you have ever experienced such incidents with your class.
but I can see that everybody has experienced that. So I'm not the only one, I'm not the only weirdo who is concerned about what his students can do with their project. Right. Okay. At the very beginning, I thought that it was probably my mistake because my students didn't really know how to work with that. It was the very first time that they had tablets on their hands. We had been trying to persuade them that this is not a toy, this is not an expensive toy, it's not a game console, but it's something that you need um, that can help you work seriously. However, for some of them, it was as if they were in the candy store. At the very beginning, I had vaguely, vaguely explained what they need to do, but I realized that because they were young, and sometimes even older, older um, students, they needed some guidance. So after much thought, I realized that I should try and raise awareness about what's happening in these cases, and I should help them develop some text attack skills. Usually, well, when, when I was a student, text attack skills had to do with, with the passage on paper. And it hadn't occurred to me then that what we needed to do was to transfer these skills on web text. I feel that if we need to help them um, um, produce projects without resorting to copying and pasting, what we need to do is help them with reading tasks and writing tasks. So basically this is what I did with my A1 Common European Framework students. And I tried it with my, sec with my A2 Common European Framework students. One of the projects they had was to create a fact file about their favorite wild animal. And everybody got excited because they could um, copy, um, copy and paste beautiful photos of their favorite animals. Now the problem though comes when, it, when, when they have to use information, they have to find information. So um, I tried it in class with my students and I said, right, where could you find um, credible information? Which, which site is the most popular one to find information about animals? And they all said Wikipedia, so we tried Wikipedia. I asked them which animal they would like to talk about, so they went, we want the lion. And this is what we um, typed on the search engine and we found this one. Now, they, well, this is a print screen, um, so it's not very clear, but do you really think that this is the kind of text that an A1 or an A2 student, pu uh, pupil who's 10 years old, could they deal with that? Could they deal with words like currently exist, vulnerable species, designated, reserves? It's highly unlikely. So based on my previous experience, had I asked them to do the project, they would probably have copied and pasted it. They would have found beautiful photos of lions, and then they would have come to, to the classroom insisting on presenting it and sharing their work with, with their fellow students. Now, as we moved down, we felt that things were a, a bit better because I, we could use the visual content, um, there were maps, and we could also find contents. Now the problem they had was that the text was far too long for their age, and honestly, they didn't really know where to look for. Now this is a friendlier form to read that. So I said, why, why don't you think about, and I asked them to work in pairs, I want you to think about what kind of information you want to um, look for. Would you be interested in uh, finding about where the lion lives? And they said yes. Would you be interested in what kind of food um, the um, animal has? And they, they went yes. And they also wanted to find out about how big the lion is and some more information. So I said, why don't you scan the text and try and find out familiar words, 
words that you know. They had the tablets on their desks, so they went through the text, and I asked them to um, highlight it. They can do it on the tablet. Their problem was that they couldn't find any familiar word, words that would indicate where they could find the information they were looking for. So the next thing I did was, and I thought they were right, I said, right, what are the words that you know? They knew the word weight, home, food, what it looks like. And I, I, on the board, I asked them to do this simple matching exercise. They have to find, match the words, find another word for weight, or a word which indicates weight. And I, I, I used that in L1, making sure that they understood what the whole thing was about. Find another word for home. And, and there we talked about the word habitat, food. And, the, and the, they matched it with the word diet and what it looks like. I was lucky because some of the words were Greek. Diet and characteristic are exactly the same in Greek. And kilos is universal, so everybody knows what the whole thing is about. Surprisingly, after this kind of, of exercise, they were able to detect some kind of information. They scanned it again, and they came up with some data, which made them happy, which um, um, gave them confidence to deal with the text. So the next step was uh, um, to save the information, mention the source somewhere, save it on their tablet, and then try to um, um, analyze the information they, they had found. I asked them to work in pairs, and they had to select the necessary information so that they could create a fact file about the animal. A fact file that would, that would say a lion is, lives so many years, lives in Africa, um, eats meat, et cetera, et cetera. Surprisingly, things, things were much, much easier than I expected. And they came up oh, with real life language. They produced projects um, that were up to their own standards. And above all, what I really enjoyed with them was that, that they, um, they felt really proud presenting it to, the, to their fellow students. Another very um, popular exercise that I often do with my students, because I realize that the internet is a vast place, and very often students are not able to, to trace the right information. In one of the course books that we have, um, there's a text about Mexico City and about what living conditions are like there. And at the end of the unit, one of the exercises is Try and find out what living conditions are like in New Delhi. You have to find information and compare it with the living conditions in the city or town you live in. Now, the problem that you might have is, where do you start? What do you type on, on, on a search engine? Do you type New Delhi? Do you type life in New Delhi? Do you type living New Delhi? So what I usually do with my students is I ask them to work in pairs or in groups. And this is practical because if you ask everybody to go on a web um, quest, in all likelihood, the internet is going to be extremely slow. And they, first of all, they need to decide what are the, the best keywords for um, the search engine. And then the, the group which finds um, the, the right information first wins a prize. Surprisingly, um, students do it much, much faster than I would do because they're very good at searching for information on the internet. However, the main problem is that they can't easily find keywords for the search engine. With this specific example, um, most of my students came up with New Delhi or India or um, living in New Delhi, which meant that, that they couldn't really find the information they wanted. They were inundated with information. 
So what I'm, I'm suggesting is that maybe what you could do with your students is try to direct them to the right kind of information. And after that, you can proceed with skimming and scanning with the text, um, guiding them on how to find the right information. Because some of them simply cannot understand the whole process unless somebody shows it to them. Now the next part was to raise awareness because let's face it, who wants to spend time during a project, especially if sometimes projects are boring. Now one of the problems I had was to raise awareness. Now I will ask you to watch a video, but this time I would like to, um, to have your responses. I want you to watch a video and tell me what happened to this man and why this happened. I want you to watch the video and I want you to tell me what happened to this man and why did this happen. Okay, I think we can start the video. If for any reason you German can't... Defense the yeah, the resigns from yes. all political offices over a plagiarism row. Now Chancellor Angela Merkel will have to contest the March polls without her most popular minister. German Defence Minister Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg, embroiled in a plagiarism scandal, resigns from all his political offices on Tuesday. He was stripped of his doctorate after admitting last week his PhD dissertation was flawed. Gutenberg was the most popular member of Chancellor Angela Merkel's cabinet. Merkel had backed Gutenberg because she needed the only bright spot in her cabinet in March elections. He apologized to Parliament after being accused of copying parts of the dissertation without correct attribution. He previously rejected charges of plagiarism and refused to resign over the affair. Gutenberg, 39, has long been the most popular minister in Merkel's cabinet. But the aristocrat's popularity was based on his carefully nurtured image for honesty and integrity. German media have found scores of copied passages in his dissertation. He said he made mistakes but not deliberately. In recent days, some conservatives distanced themselves from him. Education Minister Enid Schaven on Monday called Gutenberg's actions shameful. Parliamentary President Thank you. I can. I think we can switch back to the slides. So, can I have your answers in writing? What happened to this man? For some reason, I can't see any comments. I don't know, John. Are there any comments on the chat box? Uh, yeah, if you look in the, the chat, there should be comments. Uh, people are typing comments. I uh, Adrian, Freya, James, they've all typed comments in the chat box. I, I can't see them. Ah. I, I, I can't see them. <laughs> okay. I can't see uh, any comments through, I mean, from the very beginning. Uh, well, maybe uh, you could read them out to me. Sure, sure. Uh, Adrian said uh, he had to resign because he uh, plagiarized. Freya, he resigned because of a plagiarism scandal in his dissertation. And James said he copied some of his PhD. Uh -huh. Right. So um, is that serious, obviously? Um, is it serious when a, um, a minister loses his job? Undoubtedly. Um, if you were 39 years old and you were an aspiring politician, would that cost you? Definitely. So this is a video you can use with your older classes. Um, teenagers or maybe um, um, adults, if you're teaching adults. And I think it, it works very well in the sense that 
people um, start realizing that copying and pasting is not as innocent as it seems to be. If a minister lost his job, um, then obviously this is serious. And if any of your students thinks that um, this doesn't happen very often, or it happened only once and it happened in Germany, well, there are similar stories. Um, the first one is the same about um, the German minister from BBC. Um, the second one is about another minister, two years later in Germany again, who lost her job. And this time, it wasn't any minister, it was a minister of education, which was quite an embarrassment. So obviously, plagiarism is a thorn issue, and it can cost people a lot. Okay. Well, if you're not into video, I got that from um, the BBC. You can find the source there. I want you to read it as quickly as possible and tell me what the writer believes about plagiarism, whether plagiarism is widespread or it's not very common. So uh, Adrian has said that it's uh, definitely widespread. All right. Well, now I can see the comments. Thank you. Ah, good. Yes, it is definitely. Yes, I can see them now. Thank you. It's definitely widespread. Yes. And hunting is a key word. Excellent. And if you go to the the next page, it comes from the same, um, the very same article. You can read about the German defense minister. And, and and about groups um, which which are devoted to um, um, hunting people who plagiarize. So if, if your students are not into video, you could easily show them this this um, um, article from the um, the BBC website. Um, that sounds very nice for um, older students. The question, though, is what do you do with younger students? What do you do with um, um, junior high school or primary school students who just want to do a project, show off a little bit about their wi computer whiskey um, skills, and that's it? And of course, the answer you, you would get if you showed them this video well, would be, well, who cares? I don't want to become a minister. I have not put that on a, on a, a slide, but whenever I asked students to present their, their project, they were mainly proud for one reason, because they shared their work with their colleagues. Now, do you think that their, uh, um, their um, mates' approval and recognition by their mates, is it an important factor why they're coming into class? And do they really appreciate that? Let me have your, your opinion on that. If you were 10, 11, or 12, or even 14 years old, would that be important for you? That's right. It's very important for them. Especially if they, if they they have fallen in love with somebody and they want to show her or him that they are good students or that they are intelligent. Now, what happens if you read a passage like the one we have just seen to students who don't have a clue of what you're talking about? What usually happens is that the, cl the whole class turns off. They will start playing. They will either start playing with their tablets or they will start chatting. They will, they will um, exchange notes and messages. And the presenter is going to simply make a, a fool of himself or herself. What I tried to do with younger um, students was I, I tried to emphasize that they should not lose face when they present their project. And because everybody wants recognition from his group, 
this is probably what counts most. Young learners and teenagers would not care about punishment. They wouldn't show um, the desired ex um, um, respect for the rules. After all, for, for some of them, the rules are there to be broken. It, sometimes it's a challenge for them so that they won't be detected. But when it comes to presenting in front of your classmates, uh, you need to make sure that whatever you present is interesting. Because at the end of the session, at the end of the lesson, when, when your fellow students vote for, your, for the best project, you want your project to be the best one. And if they can't understand it because you couldn't be bothered, you were far too lazy and you just copied and pasted things, you just showed disrespect to them. So what I usually do at the very beginning of the year uh, is I have a general discussion with my students about showing respect to your fellow students, about how to present, and whether um, copying and pasting is a good idea or not. After the discussion, usually I have a few people who will try and test it and see if what we've discussed in class applies. And to their surprise, it applies. So instead of, of threatening them with punishment or whatever, it would be a good idea to, to just warn them that they will lose face with their classmates. And so far, it seems to be working. And if you want to reinforce that, what you can do is have it in the evaluation rubrics. What I've tried with my students is I've asked them to work on evaluation rubrics of, of the project on the projects that their, their fellow um, um, students present. Now, this is one that my younger students came up with. And of course, we had smiles um, and icons because it was much easier for them. And we decided on the categories that they, they wanted to give their um, fellow students marks. One of them was originality, which is, in other words, um, in other words, how not to copy and paste, whether it's interesting, whether it's relevant. Sources was another point that we had discussed, that we always uh, mentioned sources where we found that. And of course, whether the presentation was boring or interesting. Now, of the five areas, which ones do you think have to do with copying and pasting or with plagiarizing? I just feel happy now that I can see the chat box and I can see people typing. Yes, sources, original, that's right. Source and originality are linked directly. But also presentation has to do with, with whether they've copied and pasted. Because if it's not their product, they don't feel confident to present it. If it's something that you have just copied and pasted, from my experience, you don't really spend time on it. You learn nothing out of it. You just do it. You put it on the, the PowerPoint slide, and then you feel happy because you've done something, but you haven't really learned anything. And because from the very beginning, you are determined not to spend enough time on that, you don't feel confident to present it. You just go into the classroom, and you just read it aloud. Sometimes you can't even do that because it's infested with unknown words or terms you've never come across. And it can be quite embarrassing when the teacher asks, very interesting, what does this word mean? Could you explain to your um, fellow students? It also has to do with um, to the point, whether it's relevant or not. Because as, as I explained earlier, very often they will find information, they will just copy and paste it without really checking whether the content is relevant or not. They might be um, misled by one or two words that uh, seem to be relevant to the project they have. Can technology help? Absolutely. Um, technology can be of help. Um, this is one site that I found, um, and I think it's quite useful. Um, what, what you do there is you basically copy the, um, the text they give you, and, and then you um, um, copy it on, on the special box they have. 
Um, and then the software checks it for you. The problem is that it can only detect things which are on the internet. It cannot really detect things which are um, uh, on printed material. Um, I found many interesting um, uh, free software um, websites where you can you can download detection tools and you can find uh, at the bottom of the page um, um, the URL for the um, article. It's a very interesting one. I've tried all of them and they seem to be very helpful. Now the question is what do you do if you don't have the technology to do it? And very often your students might come with something with a project just like my daughter did. Handwritten, then it takes too much time to type it and check on the internet. Well, from my experience, you can find out if they have very long text. And usually the vocabulary is beyond their learners, the, the learner's level. Um, they cannot explain the words, they cannot explain the notion in plain English or sometimes even in L1, which means they haven't worked on it. They don't mention any sources and they find it difficult to present it. At the very beginning of the presentation, there was this question, why should I be bothered? What has this got to do with real world? Isn't that far too academic? Now I found that in one of the most popular C2 exams. Um, this comes from a handbook. It's a writing task and it says candidates are required to write an essay summarizing and evaluating the key ideas contained in two texts of approximately 100 words each. Basically, they, uh, this comes from the um, Certificate of Proficiency in English, but there are other exams which require students to read or listen to um, lectures and then they have to um, take notes um, and then use the material they, they've, uh, they've collected to write an essay or even talk about it. Now, if they're not used to paraphrasing, if they're not used to um, um, working on text, it's highly unlikely that they will do well at the exams. Um, I agree with you, James. It is amazing. They, they think that um, teachers will never notice. Somehow, though, I think you can read it on their face. Uh, they always have this, this guilty look. So, why should we bother? Hmm. First of all, it sets a precedent. Um, if, if they get used to that and they get away with it, this is what they will be doing for the rest of their life. And, and as James says, yes, it's very common among adults too. I once attended uh, um, the Greek Open University and there were so many people who simply plagiarized. And they, half of them didn't have a clue of what plagiarizing was. Um, the other half thought it was, it was perfectly le legitimate to do so. Students learn to cheat and they learn not to work on things. Um, there are certainly benefits in using technology in class, but copying and pasting without really learning anything is definitely not one of the benefits. They learn nothing because they don't work with the text, they don't work with, with the material they have, they just copy it, paste it, and within 10 minutes, or even five minutes, because they're very fast, they think they have come up with a project. And the next big question is, what will happen when they go to university? I know colleagues my age who were never told about plagiarism, they were never taught how to use sources, how to mention sources, um, and they found themselves in a very difficult situation when they handed in their first, the very first assignment. Some of them were accused of plagiarism. Thank God it was their very first assignment and, and um, university professors asked them to, to hand it in again. Um, some other times 
they, they, they realized that, that there was something terribly wrong in the way they had been taught English. So if you're thinking of sailing in uncharted waters, and if you're thinking of dealing with um, popping and pasting or plagiarism, call it any, any way you like, here are some tips and hints. Yes, it takes time, it takes effort, and it requires your patience. Try not to make it personal. Um, I've always tried to keep it um, impersonal. I, whenever I showed them um, pieces of work that I received, I always made, made sure that I never mentioned the name, um, but I always condemned the practice. I praise the students even if their, their end product is not a desirable one, provided it's their own effort. And I think it's quite clear, um, if you know your students, you know who's worked on the, on the, on the text um, or the, the project by themselves and who has uh, resorted to um, copying and pasting. Try to involve learners. Um, with my young le learners, what we actually do at the end of each presentation is I ask them, is that original or is it copy-paste? Whenever it's, it's a, um, um, the outcome of copying and pasting, then the person who's, who's done that feels really ashamed. And my students usually pinpoint whenever they think this is copy-paste. It also helps um, to keep reminding your students to focus on the target audience. Yes. They, they might find something that's written in academic language and they will have to make it simpler. Or they might find something which is written in a different register than the audience they need to address to. And this is something that will help them, help them later on in their, their everyday life. And then we come to the next question. Do we really follow these rules? Don't we set examples as educators? Do we really mention sources? Whenever we um, um, show them things on, on the interactive whiteboard, whenever we use material, do we tell them where we got that from? Have we ever raised um, awareness by having a discussion about copyright issues on the internet, about what is, is um, um, legitimate, um, whether it's important to give credit to people who have written something or have stated something. And apart from the, the exams, I think this also has to do with, with um, our role as, as true educators, um, instilling principles and values that they will probably follow for the rest of their life. It's very useful to, to remember that we need to follow these rules. I would like you to say, I would like to thank you for being here with me. I apologize because at the very beginning I couldn't see your comments and I thought that you weren't very active. Now that I can go back, I can see many comments and I'm so thankful for being um, actively involved. And I'm, I'm looking forward to um, reading any questions that you might have. Uh, thank you, Dimitris. That was a very interesting, uh, very practical uh, session on copy and paste. Uh, does anybody have a question they'd like to ask our speaker today? It's a, a small audience, but uh, I thought they were I thought they were active. So hopefully they'll have a question or two. Well, now going um, through the comments, um, I'm very glad that we're so active. Yeah. I truly enjoyed your tips at the end. I thought that those were very practical and in that for all of us to keep in mind. <clears throat> it is a thorny issue. And basically, mm -hmm. you can either pretend that, that you haven't seen anything, just turn a blind eye to it. Um, or you can start dealing with it gradually. And my, I'm, I'm, I was really glad that, that students got actively involved in that because you usually have students who 
work, they work hard to present mm -hmm. a project, and they don't really like the idea that somebody else is copying and pasting. That's um, true. James is asking if, if I think that teachers are too quick to, to blame the students and not reflect on they could have done better. Yes, I, I agree with you. I realized that um, um, early on because the, the, my students had the tablet, but I realized that I lecturing is not a very good idea. You need to do things with them. Uh, they need to get their hands on the text. They need to feel confident that they can do that. And especially when it comes to projects, I think you, you should gradually um, um, give them, um, the, you should gradually increase the level of difficulty. If you give them something very difficult that requires um, um, synthesizing and analyzing, and it's beyond their, their um, um, competence, it's, it's something that will discourage them. From my experience, if you start with small projects, projects that they can deal with, and, and keep praising them and raising their awareness, they often do it and it, it works really well. Uh, but you're right, I, I think first we should reflect, am I doing enough to raise the issue? Do my students really know? Or are they trying to um, um, fool me and I'm trying to fool them? Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely correct that sometimes we don't reflect enough on what we could do better to help our students avoid this problem. So, great. Anybody else have a question? It doesn't look like it. Well, on behalf of Belta, Demetrius, I'd like to thank you again for your willingness to uh, present today on this very interesting topic. Um, I think everybody got something out of it, and hopefully when we post it on our website, more people will be able to appreciate everything that you had to say today. Um, I'd like to remind everybody that our next uh, Sunday in Be with Belta webinar will be on the 22nd of November, and Joanna Sterling will be talking about teaching humans online, uh, another very interesting uh, topic, I believe as more and more of us are switching to online teaching as opposed to face-to-face -face teaching. So again, thank you for attending today, taking time out of your Sunday to be here with us today, and hopefully we'll see you um, in about a month's time at our next webinar. Again, Demetrius, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Greetings from Greece.